Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm so happy to be greeting you today. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. And I'll tell you a little bit more of that as, as we go into the call. But I just want to start with a moment of prayer, just invoking the presence and the power and expressing deep gratitude for each one of you and each of your lives. And so let's join together in that moment. And we simply say, come Holy Spirit, oh, beloved one. We come into this awareness of this platform that we are able to join, a network of light that goes around the world. And I'm seeing Michaela's face and realizing that she's here from Austria. I'm seeing Daniel's face and being aware of the many, many years uh, that he came to Unity of Tustin and, and what a beautiful presence he was there. And I'm seeing Carol, Coral's face and being aware of her in Arkansas and how she co-led one of the sites. <laughs> I'm seeing Fabian's face and remembering when she did Site 6, which we'll talk about at one point in more detail again. And I'm seeing Ed. <laughs> I sent him a video this, uh, this week, <laughs> and I'm going to quote some of the words of uh, the song that's on that video that I sent to him. And Soren, I'm so glad to see you. And Donald, oh, amazing miracles in your life. And coming out of the connection with Michaela, a medical doctor, when your wife went through a stroke. And it just goes and goes and goes. And Daniel, how beautiful to see you. <laughs> you photographed almost all of the years of um, Daniel Douglas. <laughs> uh, you photographed, uh, videoed all of the year, first year of Called by Love uh, at Unity Intestine Live. So this is a celebration of deep, deep gratitude, but it's also going into prayer and inviting the healing presence. And Fabian, I'll let you pick up here and share what that's about. Yes, thank you, Marge, and welcome, everyone. As we're opening the secret space for our time together, um, we also wanted to send prayers, um, obviously, to everyone in the world who needs prayers and healing and love in any way. And also specifically, um, John, Melanie's husband, who was just in a car accident this morning. Um, thankfully, nothing is broken, but obviously it was shaking. And so thank you, Melanie, for being with us. And we're definitely holding you and John uh, in our prayers for his full recovery and again, for everyone um, on the call, all those we know and all those we don't know who need prayers today and always. Thank you. And so we come back into this amazing awareness of gratitude again. And I'm seeing Norma, Norma Kukalar, and really sending you gratitude for all of the years and the many gifts that you brought in all of the ways that you contributed so deeply to Unity of Tustin and Marla. <laughs> Marla was on staff for a while and no longer lives even in Tustin, but still is very involved in our online ministry. And it just so incredible. And Marla's shifted into a role now as a visiting angel. Uh, that, what an appropriate title. <laughs> a visiting angel. <laughs> uh, so good, so good, so good. So as we prepare to start the call, we simply just come into that awareness of these connections, like with you, Kathy Hill, that have lasted 
in the realms of timelessness, even though we're not physical present, physically present with each other all of the time now as we once were, our connection is really stable, <laughs> it's solid, it's a foundation in our lives. And so we are so deeply, deeply grateful. And the other thing that I am deeply, deeply grateful for today, deep, deep gratitude, is that for this call, Unity of Tustin mailed to their entire list. I am so thrilled about that. And if you came on the call as a result of reading Unity of Tustin's mailing, hold up your hand so that uh, I can just especially acknowledge you. So Rosie, welcome, welcome. And I know many of you also are on their mailing list and on Called by Love's mailing list also. How beautiful it is when we can join together in spirit as one. Spirit is always about oneness. Spirit is about no separation. I am that, always already. Then we are individualized souls. The potential for our having spent some previous lifetimes together totally exists. <laughs> but in this lifetime, we know that we've connected at a deep heart level. And then our physical embodiment, this life in the physical that is a precious, precious part of our experience over how many years. So today we're going to talk about that over how many years. We're going to be um, talking about uh, how that becomes part of the foundation of our life. And I have... Uh, um, uh, Mary Jean Haas, who is the uh, ministry director at Unity and Tustin now, and her husband, John, in part, to thank for some of the way that I've wove this call together. And John and uh, Mary Jean didn't know that that would happen. It was uh, totally um, unintended. Uh, Jim DeFontis told uh, John Haas a, a story that I had told him about someone John used to work for in Kansas City, a restaurant owner. His name was Joe Gilbert. And as a result of that, uh, John came up to me a couple of Sundays ago and said, I want to hear that story from you. <laughs> and so I gave him a short debrief about an organization that I had or, uh, founded at a junior high school when I was a high school, junior high school, teaching seventh grade. And, um, and told him the story and he said, what year was that? I didn't even remember. So what I did was come home and go into my cedar chest uh, or treasure chest, that's what I would call it. It's an old trunk that's in uh, the library downstairs. And I knew there was a plaque. And Fabian has a picture of that plaque. And um, if you can screen share, Fabian, I'm going to let you do that. And I'm going to read to you what that plaque says. You'll notice up at the top of the plaque, there's a symbol. That's a symbol for the Kansas City Exchange Club. And in the left-hand upper corner, there's the word unity. I had never heard of unity at that point in time in my life. And as I looked for the date, I found out it was 1967. I was still married to uh, my first husband, who was my son's father. His name was Hurlbert. And uh, so you'll notice that the name on this plaque says, Mrs. Marjorie Hurlbert. <laughs> I haven't used that name for years. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of grateful because on another plaque that I got that same year uh, relative to the same award, some of the people that signed that were Mrs. 
and their their feminine name is missing they use their husband's name it's the uh, <laughs> The early um, or an a, an earlier form of burkas in the United States, where women dis disappeared behind their husbands' names. <laughs> but in this one, at least my name is there, uh, even though uh, it was my first husband's name that followed it. Britt was my maiden name. It was my father's name. And so... Um, when people call me Mrs. Brett, I uh, inform them I'm not married to my father. <laughs> anyway, let me just read some of these words to you. At the top, it says greater Kansas City area, outstanding Metropolitan Service Award. And it is an inaugural presentation that was given to me and to the boys and girls who founded GIFG. Now, it doesn't say what that stands for, but it stands for getting involved for good. There was an article in this junior scholastic magazine about uh, a murder on the streets of New York City. And the woman who was being murdered was screaming and crying for help and no one responded to her. And it was known that there were people who heard her, but no one responded. And there was an article about this in Junior Scholastic Magazine. And the students and I talked about it. And, 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 and I asked the question, what would it mean to get involved for good? And that question, what would it mean, was the initial question that led to the forming of an organization called the GIFG Club. It ended up being written up uh, and celebrated uh, not only in Kansas City, but nationally in the Ned National Education Association Journal. And uh, it was awarded to those boys and girls, seventh graders, for establishing, in other words, founding, and fostering, that means doing it. So it's about starting it and acting upon it, fostering unity of service, a unity of service program, they called it. And so the word service is also up here in the symbol of the Kansas City Exchange Club. It is a service organization. My life has been devoted to teaching selfless service, which is a repeat. It's an upshift, a repeating pattern from this early, early imprint, seeding of consciousness that goes back in my own life to 1967. I was in my 20s at that time. And it's... Uh, it was a recognition for being for examples of good citizenship. So there it is presented February 16th, 1967, on the occasion of Crime Prevention Week. And it, it received not only uh, recognition from Joe Gilbert, who invited all of his, the students to come to his uh, airport restaurant, uh, which he owned at the old downtown airport. And he sent a bus to uh, transport them there. He treated them all, celebrated them all. And, but it also brought recognition from television coverage. And, and one of the interviewers, interestingly, at one point in time, interviewed my son, Bud. And he was in grade school at that time. I believe he was in early years of grade school. And they said to this child, what does your mom do? And he said, oh, she's on TV and stuff. <laughs> you can tell he was very impressed with the fact that he was being interviewed <laughs> by a television reporter. <laughs> but he didn't even remember to mention that his mom was a teacher. <laughs> so it's fascinating. We focus on the things that are in front of us in our moments in time, and we don't always recognize that. So uh, let's go back to our other uh, 
uh, gallery view, Fabian, instead of the screenshot. So it's so beautiful to have all of you here today. Just a wonderful, wonderful gift for me. And, and I look down at, uh, at the screen and see your faces. And I realize that you are part of the same energy that was present in being seated in my life back there in 1967. I had never heard the word unity as it related to a church or a spiritual organization. I didn't even know it existed. I, the word service had not been forefront in my mind. I was just being a good teacher, doing the role that I was doing for junior high school students. I thought back today and thought, who do I remember in that class? And I can only think of one name. It was Leroy Jones. And the reason I remember Leroy is because he was the person who struggled the most to learn. And so I developed a special relationship with Leroy Jones. Sometimes I would take him home instead of having him walk or go on the bus. And, I, and we just became friends. And one year he brought me a, a box of chocolates that didn't no longer had the cellophane wrapper, <laughs> which meant obviously it had been opened. <laughs> But he gave it to me and he said, with a note, there was a note inside of it, said, you are the beast teacher I ever had. <laughs> I will never forget that note. You are the beast teacher, <laughs> B-E-S-T, <laughs> no, B-E-A-S-T. <laughs> beast teacher I ever had. So part of me is a beast and part of me is best and part of me is teacher. So is that also true for you? So thank you, Jim DeFontis, for uh, mentioning Joe Gilbert to um, uh, John Hawes. Thank you, John Hawes for being curious enough to say, I want to hear the story from you. And thank you, Mary Jean, when John wasn't there the next Sunday and I took the plaque to show him. Thank you, Mary Jean, for noticing that word unity at the top. I had never even noticed that. Is it the way it works when spirit is seeding our destiny path? And are there repeating patterns that show up again and again? Before I leave Unity of Tustin, there's just two, talking about them, there's just two more things I want to mention. There is a course starting tomorrow night with Shara on the spiral, which I taught and Don, uh, Don Beck came. And, uh, and Don Beck, came multiple times to Unity of Tustin and taught spiral dynamics. And I learned my first really, really deep dive glimpses of the spiral through learning directly from Don Beck, as many people at Unity and Tustin did. And he would come back each time he came uh, he, he was on the faculty of a university in Central California, and every time he came to teach there, he would stop at Unity and Tustin and do a week-long intensive uh, or several-day intensive ahead of time. And so it was every time he came, he taught levels beyond he had taught what he had taught before. And so we learned from the founder of uh, Interval Spiral integral spiral, I think he calls it now. It was just spiral dynamics then. And, and we learned directly out of the book on spiral dynamics that uh, Don Beck was the co-author of, along with Chris Cohen. The other thing is that uh, Shara is picking this up, not because she heard it from Don Beck, 
but because she learned it from Richard Rohr. And it was imprinted in Richard Rohr, and then it was imprinted in Shara, and Shara is bringing it back now to Unity of Tustin. And there will be people at Unity and Tustin that have never heard it before. Probably over half of the community now wasn't even there when Don Beck was coming there. And so this is the way it works. It's a generational kind of thing. And it keeps getting planted and keeps getting seeded over and over and over again. And I want you to be aware of that. The other really important thing that it comes out of for me is the contemplative tradition that was so deeply important at Unity Intestine. It came through um, Father Thomas Keating's teachings and centering prayer, but now it's being imprinted through uh, Craig uh, Phillips, Craig Stephen Phillips teachings, who actually is doing it through the Tao tradition. All of these traditions are just simply different views through the window of meditation, contemplation. And Craig is doing an all day Sunday class, um, a Sunday afternoon class uh, next Sunday. So we sent you the link for both Shara's class and for Craig's class in our reminder email, or you can get it to register on Unity Tustin's website, or if you want to donate to Unity of Tustin, Unity Tustin, www.unitytustin.org. And, you know, the evolution of what's happening there is so beautiful to me. The triad, uh, is what Jim uh, DeFontis calls it. Uh, I love to call it a trinity. It's exactly the kind of structure that is part of the evolution of consciousness when we begin to understand how consciousness works in the rare stages at the collective active. It's collaborative. It's no longer about superstars or uh, one senior minister. It's collaborative. And it's a flowing consciousness where gifts of genius are passed person to person and in roles of participating and then ultimately learning and then in roles of leadership. So it's, it's quite incredible. So I'm now what I want to do is to take a deep dive into the reminder email and just highlight a couple of things before we start applying it. So the title of, or the theme idea this week relates to site one in the meditation garden. Now it's not in the title, why not? If this is about site one and that's so important in my book and in the unity teachings, uh, uh, Eric Butterworth taught it in his book on co-creation. Why didn't we put it in the title? Because it needs to be seen in all of its glory, in all of its many facets. And sometimes we emphasize one facet, sometimes another. So today we're emphasizing discovering your destiny in the foundations of your life. It's very, very interesting. Foundations is about structures. In order to build a 12-story apartment building or a 40-story office building, you have to have a very, very strong foundation. You have to have a really good architect that knows how to draw the plans and how to build it. You have to have engineers who know how to take the plans from uh, blueprints into structure. You have to have people who are gifted at doing what they know how to do. And then working together, they bring in all of the people who will live there, who will work there, who will be part of that structure for the highest purpose that they know. And at different levels of the structure, there may be different purposes. So I was really, really 
um, I, I, wondering. I, I'm, since I stepped off of the bricks and mortar platform, I've taken deep dives into research of, in the stages of development and how it develops and works in consciousness. And I've been so curious, how does it all go together? And they all start at birth and they go through often um, cycles um, of development, stages of development. They're defined in different ways by different authors. There's lots of different authors and um, different books that describe it differently. Some about leadership, some about education, some about uh, simply the evolution of consciousness, some about um, individual experiences of it, some about collective experiences of it. It's called the we space. And, um, and yet, what's missing from all of those is involution. That is in Charles Fillmore's teaching. It's in Eric Butterworth's teaching. It's in my book. It's in the foundational teachings of unity. And I don't see it in the intellectual academic structures, even the research structures. There is nothing that really measures involution. And yet for me, it is the first movement of spirit. And uh, in the Bible, it starts out in the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, there was darkness and void on the face of the waters. And then it's, and God said, let there be light. So in the second paragraph of the reminder email, you find this question. What if you have been given glimpses over your entire lifetime? And you didn't or couldn't recognize the multiple levels of cosmic vibrations of light. What if the glimpses have been there all along, revealing themselves in the foundations of your life? That means you, Daniel Rodriguez. That means you, John Claude. And you're going to lead some people through the meditation garden on the World Day of Prayer. So this is all about that. It means you, Coral, as you took what you learned about stages to Arkansas. And right now they're in the midst of a pandemic in Arkansas. How important that you are there as a spiritual teacher and light in a place that's experiencing darkness right now in the, the health systems that are on overload. And um, it's so amazing. These kinds of teachings and needs never get outdated. They have to get updated sometimes as we learn more. They have to get translated into the languages that, that they are important for. But what we're about today, as far as we get, is a, a quest and a vision where we will simultaneously begin to understand both time and timelessness. Timelessness is the vertical descent of the Holy Spirit. It's the descent of the dove. And I told Fabian to come in anytime she needed to adjust something. <laughs> Thank you, Fabian. <laughs> I learned that from Tama Keeves, who I'm taking a course from now. And her husband shows up over her shoulder. He, he does all of her technical stuff for her. And he'll wave and adjust something. And I thought, wow, if he could do that, his name is Paul. Fabian could do that when we're on a call. And so thank you, Fabian. Fabian does such amazing work behind the scenes and in front of the camera, both and. So, um, so, so important. And so time is in the horizontal dimensions. It's, it's located, we can tell what it is by looking at the computer and seeing what time it is. We can look at our watch, seeing what time it is, or it can be 
in the vertical dimensions, which is about timelessness, past, present, and future as one in an ascending path or a descending path. Spirit descends, the soul ascends. Heard a really interesting comment in an interview with someone in the Taliban um, uh, coming out of Afghanistan this week. And he was explaining why it was never going to work for the United States and Afghanistan. He looked at uh, the person's watch and he said, you're in charge of time that way, the way you know it. We're in charge of time our way. And we'll be here. <laughs> and you're not in charge of that. Interesting. So all kinds of ways for us to begin to understand each other. And so in the third paragraph, it in our reminder email, it asks the questions, what words have you heard potentially over and over at different times? Like let there be light or the words of Jesus. You are the light of the world. Have you seen them as pointers to your destiny? Have you seen them as guides to your future? Have you seen them as signs that you are called by God? And have there been repeating patterns of light that are at different vibrational levels? Because every single garden site, every single pattern of color, um, light in the rainbow, all of the colors of the rainbow have different vibratory fields of light. One vibratory field is foregrounding. All of them are there always already. That's what happens when spirit descends, but one is foregrounded. So site one is about let there be light. Psych 2, which I hope we'll work with a bit next month, uh, is about faith and trust. Have you had any issues of faith and trust? What do you need to learn about it? Interestingly, I was on Tama's call last night. And that was what she was teaching the last 30 minutes of her call. She started out by saying, when the soul, Holy Spirit sees you, everyone on this call, and she named names like I just did a little while ago. She said, everyone, no exception, is innocent. It's only your ego that judges, depending on where you, you are in the spectrum in a moment in time. The ego does that. Holy Spirit sees innocence and lives love. So, <laughs> Marla, I sent you an email this week about number one on the Enneagram, <laughs> which had a little bit about it in uh, rel related to judgment. We all have our lens through, we see, through which we see the world. Because I'm a nine on the Enneagram, which is about healing, uh, there's two wings. One's about leadership, which is the eight. The other's about uh, perfection, which is the one. And that perfection is the one that holds this tendency to judge. So fascinating. All of the things that we can learn is to put together these mysteries of consciousness. So I want to give you an example in my own life of how this worked. You'll notice um, on uh, the uh, email that if you, you uh, saw the reminder email, you'll see that there is a picture of the Flatirons in Boulder, Colorado. The Flatirons are extremely well-known and beautiful. And for anyone that's ever lived in Colorado. And, uh, and uh, it, it's a way that people identify with Colorado. And so I started just looking at my own life and 
wondering, you know, how have the repeating patterns shown up in my own life? And what, uh, what I know is that I want to be able to recognize repeating patterns in my life, depending on where they're showing up in the vibrations of consciousness. So I just sat down and just on a sheet of paper, just started jotting down things. I just put boulder up at the top. The first thing that happened, I was so involved in this question, just playing through my own curiosity and my own mind that was saying, what about involution? Where does it, how does it fit? Is it so important? Is it so significant? And huh, when I was sort of intellectually ranting about that, I had a dream the next night, that night. And it was about Boulder, Colorado. And it was about the layout of the streets in Boulder, Colorado. First Street was way up on the side of the mountain. It was called First Ridge. And my brother and I used to hike up there all of the time. There was only one house that we ever saw on First Street. And it was not even a paved road. It was hard to get to. And we'd have to sort of skirt it on the side to climb on up to the top of First Ridge. I don't even remember any houses on Second Street. I think there, they were probably further toward the road that went up to Gold Hill <laughs> in Boulder, up the canyon. Uh, but Third Street, there were a couple of them. On Fourth Street was the first paved road where you could drive on easily. Uh, when I married Bud's father, we ended up buying a house on Fourth Street which I sold to pay my tuition to go through ministerial school in part on 4th Street. 5th Street went all of the way up toward my grandparents' house. And also uh, they were between 4th and 5th Street. And that was near where the Seventh-day Adventist church is. I'm talking to you about seeds and imprints. And I want you to be thinking about similar ones in your own life. So, uh, and all the way down the hill from that foot of the mountain to Broadway, which earlier had been called 12th Street, there were streets. My grandfather and grandmother on my father's side on 8th Street. My grandparents, um, or my cousins, my aunt and uncle and cousins lived on Fifth Street. Interesting. We live in different places, whether we talk about it as a rainbow or whether we talk about it streets in the neighborhood of our childhood. We live in different places. Fabian lived in Belgium, and maybe she'll come and talk about it later. So I want to just mention a couple, few of the other ways that I can see these imprints in my own life. I was involved in, in uh, uh, Carolyn Mace talks about tribe, family, and culture as being part of the second chakra. She also talks about um, it as a very creative. It's where art comes in, painting and uh, artistic expression. So I was very, very involved in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in my childhood. Went to the private school for that. Didn't, my parents didn't want me to go to public school. They didn't want me to be uh, <laughs> influenced by what they called the heathens. <laughs> Catholics thought we were heathens. <laughs> it's amazing how churches have tended to separate people. But see, that still goes on. I hope you realize that. Uh, it happens in uh, 2021. It's part of the polarization of our country right now. 
So I was very much part of the Seventh-day Adventist culture, the school, the church. There was even a hospital up on Third Street. <laughs> Rich Texans used to come to Third Street. I had my first job being a waitress, serving rich Texans in the dining room. <laughs> and you know, plant yourself, see it in your own life. My family gave me other imprints. My, my mother was a, a graduate nurse. My father, in his desire for his children to have a stay-at-home mom, convinced her not to become a registered nurse. She didn't do that until after his death because he thought if she registered, she might be drafted. And he didn't want her to be drafted. He wanted her to stay home and take care of her of me <laughs> and my brother. You know, it, these are all cultural imprints about safety and security and uh, imprints of training. And my father was a very, very uh, highly recognized entrepreneur in Boulder. He owned Brit Truck Service. They had about 50 trucks that hauled ore out of the mines, ore that would become... <laughs> Uh, raw material for atomic bombs during World War II. And Brit Truck Service had the address of 1033 Walnut. Walnut was in downtown Boulder. That property today would be worth millions of dollars. My mother sold it when my father died because as a woman, she didn't feel capable of running a truck line. So, and my, my uncle worked for my dad. Right now, the hotel, a hotel, St. Julian Hotel in Boulder, is at 900 Walnut. It's only one block from where my father's uh, business was that spanned two blocks going north and south. And part of the Boulder Daily Camera, the newspaper now has part of that property. If, and I said this in a class one time, if my mother had not sold that property, I would be a multimillionaire now, be simply because of inheriting wealth. And someone in the class said, and if that had happened, you probably wouldn't be a spiritual teacher now. And I said, yes, that's probably true. <laughs> so notice how the universe gives us acknowledgement and sometimes takes it away. The universe gives and receives. So in my family of origin, my father's successful businessman that loves horses and has a ranch in Northeastern Colorado out in the dry land. And we go out there every weekend. And so I grow up loving horses and I grow up love art. And actually, I painted two different pictures of the Flatirons. One of them I gave to my mother-in-law, uh, Bud's grandmother. And uh, the other one I gave to my own mother because she was jealous of the fact I had given Chet's mom the first painting I ever painted. <laughs> so I, I painted another one for her. I've only painted three oil pictures and oil paintings in my life. And I learned that when I was in the Seventh-day Adventist College, Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. The show me state. No, that's, a, that's Missouri. Missouri's the show me state. <laughs> so, you know, books, mountain lakes, nature, hiking, skiing, hunting, all of the fishing, all of this was part of the imprints from my childhood. What are the imprints from your childhood? The flat irons are a, a symbol of that. The religion that is fundamentalist religion, it's the, the fundamentalist religion of the far right in the polarized country that's the United States of America in 2021. And, and it is an imprint 
does that mean it's right and I'm wrong? Does it mean that I'm right and it's wrong? Of course not. It means we're different vibrations of light in the rainbow of light. And we all are required for the rainbow to be complete. All of us. That includes all of the sites at Unity of Tussins uh, in the garden where there's symbols from traditions around the world, spiritual traditions. And so I want you to get past, if you can, the thinking that you have the right answer. If you can think of yourself of having a view of the world, a preference, that's fabulous. Everyone has those. A propensity for the way you live and move and have your being, but there's not right and wrong in the sense of uh, everyone else being wrong. So I realized that in Boulder, I spent on two worlds. Now there's still a Seventh-day Adventist church. The hospital has moved uh, further out in Boulder County. So the hospital that I was born in and grew up in, interestingly, with a woman as the doctor who delivered me, I love that, it's in my baby book, um, that's, that's gone. But what is still there is the imprint. The church is still there. What also is there in Boulder is Naropa University. That is one of the universities that teach about religions around the world. East meets West. It's also sort of the founding energy of Integral. It's where Ken Wilbur lived in the early years of his tenure as, as the primary Integral teacher. So all of these are imprints, foundational imprints that have then shown up at different times in your life in different ways. And I want you to go back over the reminder email and look at some of the questions there. What can you discover? What are the values that are the good, the true, and the beautiful? How do they show up over and over again? Maybe in different realms, maybe in different expressions. Maybe you have shifted in some of your views as I have. They would not ordain, I don't think they still do officially, women cannot be ordained in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Anyone that ordains a woman has to go outside of the box because they don't believe women <laughs> are worthy of ordination. I would not be a minister of 30 some years if I had be stayed in the Adventist church. It's really, really fascinating. Do I still have some of those deep values? Absolutely. That's where the love, my love of the Bible comes from. But I've learned to translate it from rig rigorous fundamentalism, which is very literal, to mystical, first metaphysical, which is symbolic, and then to mystical. So I have shifted through consciousness in the, the like St. Teresa of Avila, who was a Catholic mystic and uh, in Avila, Spain, and did the same thing and wrote the book on the many mansions. So what's the master plan? Can you see one in your life where you have been participating in a master plan? plan that has foundations with different vibrational frequencies? Are there repeating patterns? I had a repeating pattern come up in my own awareness when I looked at that plaque that came from the Kansas City Exchange Club. I wasn't doctor on that plaque. I was Mrs. Mrs. Hurlbert. <laughs> and and that's what all the kids called me. It's really interesting. And I remembered when my, I, I had applied for two different law school scholarships 
And I told my husband, my first husband, I had received a full scholarship because I had scored so high on the writing test of the law school admissions test. And they told me I could have a full scholarship if I would write for the law review. I was so excited about that. I told my husband and there was total silence. And he said, I don't want to be married to a lawyer. A door closed. So in the reminder email, you see doors that open and doors that close. So I want to uh, shift and go back to gallery view and invite uh, anyone that would like to share anything that just came into their awareness. Uh, things that you see that relate to your life. Raise your hand. And there's actually a place down at the bottom where you uh, can raise your hand or you can just wave. <laughs> Who would like to come on the screen and share? You can also unmute if we don't see, if you don't have your video on. So Fabian, since you're unmuted, do you want to share? Uh, not just now, no, thank you. <laughs> All right, you can always say no. If no one says yes, I'll call on someone. Marla, can you unmute? And can you, what did you hear that sort of caught your attention? Uh, good morning. Uh, Michaela has her hand raised. I don't think anybody saw it, but uh, she should probably go first because she has her well, hand Well, I'll raised. let you go first and I'll call on her next. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. What's the question again? What, what did I say or what attracted you in the reminder email that you were curious about or related to? Uh, well, I related to some things that you were just talking about, about the oil painting. I was taking oil painting classes when the pandemic started, and I never heard that story about you, and I've known you over 20 years. I never heard that. Also about your husband saying he didn't want to be married to a lawyer, I, I, my, my instant thought was, well, you could have done it anyway. And just because he w wasn't happy with it. I mean, I know back in the fifties, that was the thing you did what your husband wanted, but there was probably plenty of people that didn't. So that's, it just really struck me there that, yeah, you, he did say that, but you did choose to do what he said. So, yeah. I was still, still very imprinted with, the man as the head of the household uh, that women follow and do not lead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with even with the awareness of till death do us part. That's very fat. I think that's still an imprint in my mind. In my book, I talk about that as as being a a heart contract rather than something recorded in the courthouse. But if that was Mr. Hurlbert that you're talking about, you were divorced from him, not probably not that long afterwards. So um, I don't know, that just kind of bothers me, just like what you said early on in this call about uh, the names being the burkas for females back in the 50s. It's like, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, this is another uh, certificate from another uh, from the American Legion Auxiliary, and it's a beautiful, you know, beautifully typed out. Uh, it's signed by two different people. One is Mrs. E. E. Watson. I don't know if that's her name or her husband's name. The second person that was the fifth district president of the American Legion Auxiliary. Signed her name also, Mrs. Robert Penfold. Well, I know that her husband's name is Robert Penfold. 
The only reason I know that she's a woman is because it's a, an auxiliary and because she puts Mrs. in front of it. Right. That's a burqa. So what about 21st that? century burqa. What about the site one? You started talking about site one, but I didn't get the point. What is the point about site one related to? That's, that's where there's darkness and void in the beginning. And God says, let there be light. It initiates creation in the human form. And that's what the whole garden is about. It's what the whole ever, our whole ever, you were born uh, at a moment in time. That was, you came out of the womb, the womb was the darkness and void. You came in with a soul purpose, which you didn't know because your brain wasn't functioning at the level of knowing anything yet. It was simply imprinted with a soul's destiny that your human mind had no way of understanding. And you chose your parents. Did, does your human mind in this lifetime recognize why I have I don't know whether you've ever thought about that. No. Uh, I, one thing I know is that they took you around the world. You've lived in multiple countries, uh, all of the way from Europe to Australia. Right. So you became a world citizen very early on because your childhood chose it. No, because you're, you chose your parents. I don't know, I think it was your mother mostly that took you around the world, I'm guessing. I don't know how much I can contribute that to your father. I think your father was a police officer. So that may become part of your imprint of uh, follow the rules <laughs> and I'll lock you up if you don't. <laughs> So any other thoughts, Marla? Um, I, I guess that's it. I mean, I could, I could probably talk all day, but uh, I've got to go to work in a few minutes. So I'm just going to listen for 10 or 15 more minutes and then take off. But thanks for having a call and thanks for calling on me. I hope you all have a perfect day. Thank you. So let us congratulate you on being a visiting angel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so everyone, give Marla a round of applause for her, <laughs> her job as the visiting angel. I was blessed to be one of the people that gave her a recommendation uh, when they called me. And uh, I said, I can't think of anyone I would rather have visit me than Marla. She's so caring. She's so loving. She's absolutely beautiful. And she's also impeccable. <laughs> That can be a tough side of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Michaela, where are you? <laughs> I don't think I ever know quite how to pronounce your name. So uh, pronounce it for me. Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, it's almost impossible for someone, you know, I mean, uh, who doesn't have German as a mother tongue, tongue to, to, to pronounce. It's like, you know, I mean, it's almost impossible for me to pronounce a VH correctly. So it's Mik Michaela is this fine. <laughs> so you, what I know about you is that you're a medical or you were a medical doctor in Vienna, Austria, and that you've done a lot of world traveling and you have been a, spe a seeker for years. You found us through Adishante and Eckhart Tolle. So uh, tell us what you related to it's um it's 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 a bit strange but while you were talking you know i mean i kept thinking you know or, or something came uh, an image came up and uh, i thought you know i mean this is really the um in in many ways the foundation uh of my uh own being and um it happens to be saint stephen's cathedral which is, you, you know, I live in Vienna and uh, this is, I'm going to send a, 
I'm going to send the link of this because, um, you know, I mean, it's this huge Gothic, almost 900 year old cathedral in the middle of the city. And uh, indeed, you know, I'm gonna live in a city that has right at the center, still at the center, this huge, huge, huge uh, Catholic structure. You know, and uh, I mean, it's, 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 it has not only marked the identity of this city, but it goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, I kept, you know, I mean, this image was coming up and I thought, you know, and I remember that I've been baptized there. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it, it's part of my identity and it's part of my foundation because um, as you say, you know, I mean, all my life I've been traveling a lot. I've been traveling with my family. I've been traveling as a teenager, as a student, as, uh, you know, I mean, as a young woman. And then I started even to live in foreign countries quite a bit. But whenever I came back to Vienna, you know, I mean, the first thing, uh, ah, here it is, yes. Uh, the first thing I did was to go uh, to that church because in, in many ways, you know, I mean, it, there was something that connected me. And, um, you, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I think why I'm mentioning this, um, I grew up Catholic, um, but uh, since I was 14 or so, you know, I mean, I, I didn't lead a very religious life, not even a very spiritual life for most, uh, for most of my life. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, this, image and this structure um, accompanied me uh, throughout my life. And now uh, about, uh, what was it, about 12 years ago, uh, I moved back to Vienna. You know, it's more, it's 15 years ago. I moved back to Vienna and I, I live like a 30 minutes walk uh, from, uh, from, uh, from this, uh, from, uh, away from this church. And still so much, you know, I mean, whenever I walk there, uh, it's like, you know, I mean, I, I feel, I feel the connection and, uh, somehow to me, this has become, um, or this image has become, um, what is the word I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, um, a beacon, uh, if you will, of, uh, my path, whatever, whatever it means, but it's, it's, it's more of a feeling, but, um, um, yeah, no, this is, this is what I wanted to share. This is what was coming up was this, uh, this interesting church, even though I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not following the Catholic religion, uh, at all, but the, the significance of this spiritual structure, you know, I mean, is, is, is very much embodied in, in, in my being. Yeah. You know, I am in awe of the cathedrals in Europe. Uh, the one at Shards, you know, realizing the hundreds of years that it took to build. These are craftspeople who knew that they could not complete what they were doing in their lifetime. And yet they created this magnificence because they played their role perfectly. So it, it's amazing. And now you're on the Danube. Yeah. How does that feel to you? To, uh, say, say that again. I'm at the Danube or what? You, the river. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, the, Is Danube. the Danube. The Danube you're on or am I remembering? Yes, that? yes, yes. I'm living very close to the Danube actually. Uh, I take walks along the Danube, and it's 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 so interesting because in in Vienna there is the Danube, there's the big river, uh, and then there is a small channel which is you know uh, which is where I have I had had I think four or five apartments along the small channel, but now I live at the big river, <laughs> and uh, you know I mean every day I take walks, you know I mean I take walks along the big river and I see. It, you know, and flowing uh, quietly um, uh, down. And uh, yeah, indeed, you know, I mean, the Danube and the river 
and uh, and the church are so much, uh, you know. The symbolism. Can you relate the symbolism to your own life? Um, I'm not sure. Um, probably, you know. I mean, probably if uh, if if I think about it. Um, you know, I mean, the, the church, you know, I mean, the foundation, uh, because it's in the past 15 years or so, you know, and themes of Christianity have become so prominent for me, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, and, and again, you know, I mean, I'm not sort of, I'm not a church goer or, or I'm not following the, the Catholic right, but it has become so prominent for me. And, you know, and also you, the connection with you and, uh, and uh, uh, I've heard so many um, quotes from you that uh, have come to me from other sites, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so there is something about um, Christianity uh, that, is, uh, that is definitely, you know, I mean, a theme in my life and the river uh, stands for, you know, I mean, the, the flow, you know, I mean, simply the, simply the flow of life. Yes. And it's, it's become mighty. And that is within you. That the tributaries have all sort of coalesced in this mightiness of the flow that you now integrate from all of the different parts of your life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love taking those kinds of symbols and actually uh, applying them. So let's see who else might like to play the game. <laughs> I want to connect some dots. <laughs> I hope that the the quality will be working enough. Um, Michaela, I don't even know if I had ever told you that I did come to Vienna and uh, swam in the Danube myself. And it was just after I had uh, completed my thesis that was that I was writing on the internship that I had done in India on the in the nonprofit that I had been helping for a few months. So there is even a connection there, but I I um I just felt like that 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 sense of of course the, the Christianity being also a connection and um with your name that I might not pronounce right right either, Mikaela, I'll try. <laughs> um but you know, having been born myself in the uh, um, Archangel Michael's clinic, and then in Brussels we have this big cathedral with Archangel Michael's as well, and that's very present. You know, he's on top of the uh, um, city hall in Brussels. Like there are just like all of that. And the other thing that I was connecting with some of the things shared earlier was. Um, when you're talking about Mola being a world citizen early, or I was also thinking about growing up in Belgium, which is very small, but that did have the imprint of already having several languages and feeling like we, we had a unity, but it was a very fragile unity because there is also the threat of like, are we going to split again or, you know, and, and that's still present, but there is also that sense of um, knowing that very early on, right? Like we are, we are or language or this or that is not like the full picture. Mm -hmm. And then having, um, diversity in that way and uh i think we do have another symbol that connects us um which is uh you know in my favorite painting and uh part of it has really become uh emblematic which is uh, which is the klimt painting of the tree of life do you remember yes and, uh, it's 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 a painting that always spoke to me and uh um, I, I feel so, such a personal connection and uh, 
you know, I mean, we found out that Fabian grew up very, very close to the Palais to Play, uh, which is for, you know, the original painting, uh, actually, which is a mosaic, I think. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, have your, I have your gift right here in my back, but I don't know if I can uh, detach it to show it. So I'll, I'll yeah. see, you can keep talking. The tree, the tree of life. And lastly, you know, I mean, I found a tree of life at Unity of Trustin. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Oops, I need to remove the, I need to remove the background, I think. Okay, let me stop that. Can you see this? There it is, the tree of life, yes. That, that you brought to Big Bear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Thank you again. <laughs> and the raven in the, in the center of it. Um, is, uh, is, is a symbol of death or of transformation. Mm. Yeah. So this is how everything comes together, isn't it? <laughs> like Mark said, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's how, how, did you, how did you say it's, it's collective or it's a, it's, it's a group, um, it's, it's like a group think. Definitely. Effort group, yeah. Yeah, and Marge, when you're talking about the the imprints, I mean there are so many, right? And the the light and the dark and all of that. I would um, I'm also really aware that in terms of light and dark, uh, we are getting closer to the 20th anniversary of 9/11, and I know wherever we were in the world, like that's been an imprint as well. And for me, being right there, so there is like all the things from the early parts and family and Belgium and all of that, and then there is everything that followed. And um, again, those those repeated patterns and working through mm -hmm. the that in the in the matrix as a progressive thing. But I, I find it fascinating to see where the interconnections are and where the dots of someone connects with someone else. And it might be at a different time in our lives or it might be around the same time, but it's a different year because of our different ages, but it was in the same period in our lives or it's the same, you know, like it's, there is just so much, like even with India that we were mentioning a moment ago, like, right, Marge went to India at a different time. We went to the same places, but had different experiences. And so there is just such richness into all of that. It's incredible how it all is part of the oneness. And we dance our different colors at different times in our lives and we're still dancing the oneness. It's beautiful when we can see that. When more of the world can see that, we will stop destroying each other <laughs> or denigrating each other or dismissing each other. We will understand how important it is to, to recognize our connections rather than our separation. So who else would like to, to play the game <laughs> of finding the foundations in your life? John claude you have an very interesting background. Why don't you unmute and talk about it a bit? Yeah, I, I kind of appreciate you setting the, uh, the template for this process because I, I never kind of viewed it by looking at the whole extent of your life and seeing things in different places and then trying to pull them together and see how, how it actually comes about because everything is because I, I realized mm -hmm. as you were talking that nothing that's happened in my life I actually planned. Things have occurred that took me one place to another to another. And because 
I didn't have the capacity to understand how to do things like, you know, to go to a college or, you know, this kind of thing. it's just happened. Even the, the, the selection of the, the courses, I, I, I mean, the, the path I selected, like, you know, going into engineering and technical, you know, that kind of thing, it, I didn't know. I mean, I was just, I used to admire this cousin of mine that he was very technical and I selected like the way he, he would talk about the technical stuff. And then, and I had, I, I didn't have the feel for it, but I just, Loving the way he talked about me attracted me to that. And then unfortunately, as it turned out, it's something that I began to learn and to appreciate and, and love in the end. It it fell fell right for me, you know. But and so uh, even the, the connections of jobs from coming, you know, from I, I I was born I was born in Kenya, East Africa. And so as far as as far removed from India as possible. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I'm from an Indian extraction, but my, my parents are Christian because the part of India they came from was a place called Goa. It was a Portuguese colony. So they, they spoke, they were kind of influenced by the Portuguese and the way, very much like the Spanish, you know, so, so the, the culture I grew up was more like Spanish and a Portuguese kind of culture growing up and very Catholic and Christian and, and I began to realize you were talking in the, in the area, Kenya was quite segregated, like South Africa. You know, you had the, the whites lived in, some, in certain locations, the, the Asians communities lived in certain locations and the blacks lived in certain directions. You know, it, it wasn't part of a, apartheid or anything like that, but it, it was just the way it was. But within the, in, in the Asian community, I was introduced, like, you know, I was familiar with you know, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the all, all residing in that location. And I was raised Catholic, and, and, and it, it was made, I was made to believe that unless you believed in Jesus Christ, you wouldn't be saved. And I was, I was taught by nuns, Sisters of Mercy nuns from Ireland. So my, and you're not allowed to question. You know, you're told, and this is the way it is, and you, you know, you kind of say. And then yet, at the same time, I was really troubled because I used to play with, in sports, play with all the different nationalities that under uh, different religions, the kid, and often they would take me to their houses to have lunch or something like, and I would just see how beautiful their parents were. So loving so much, sometimes even better than the people that are, encounter in my own Catholic upbringing. And it used to, to bother me, like, how can it be so, you know, that these people kind of entered the kingdom of heaven, you know, and that, that, that was my concept of, you know, the heaven was a place you'd go to and all that. So and then, me, is so. the bothering, John claude an invitation? Absolutely. Is, is, it, is it something that, that uh, is about ultimately uh, a door opening into oneness rather than a door closing. Yes, that's what I've discovered. So because we're not, because, you know, when you were with your parents, you sort of followed what they told you, you go to church and you wanted to impress them. They were a good, you know, good person. And, and so you, but once I left home, I went to England. I lived in England, went to a university in England before I came to the States. That's why I had the freedom to go to church. And that's when I didn't really seem interested to go to the Catholic Church. I liked the foundation, the principles, the Ten Commandments are there. They were kind of instilled in me. So I, I had that to fall on. I, I felt the security. But I didn't necessarily understand the teaching didn't resonate with me. So that's what I'm saying. When I when I came to the States and when I, I, I always wanted to go to church. It, there, was, there, was, there was awareness of the divine somewhere present because I was conscious of it. And then when I discovered unity, it's one of the, the first time I came to, could I, I, I wanted to follow a Christian faith because it's something I understood. I didn't want to go into Buddhism or anything like that because this is something I knew, I was familiar. And so when, when I found unity and was Christian and was open to accepting all the other religions, that just hit home. It was like, my God, that is exactly a church I can come into. But I didn't, I didn't have the understanding. And, and then you, you were the first one 
that I encountered when, when I came there and you were talking about happiness and, and then you, and you started off, I am that. And I hadn't a clue what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I had a certain vision of how God was and kind of, you know, that's it. But that stirred up something in me because I realized you were talking about something else, not that I understood it, but I, because I, and that brought me to attending one of the, your, your, the one of the classes by a book called The Untethered, the Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Uh-huh. And you, you held, held a when is a class there and uh, David now was in it too. And, and I sat through it and that when he'd explained that there's a spiritual aspect of me as opposed to the, the ego side, differentiated that for me than, than the, the pull, the attraction happened because I realized there was so much more that I didn't know. And it was that as if the curriculum was written for me, each step of the way that, you know, I fell into things and, uh, you know, beginning to learn to pray from the heart, you know, because the Catholic that you, all your prayers were wrote, you learned it and you just repeated it. You didn't, you didn't know, I didn't know how to pray from the heart and that, and the worst thing, and I, I chose to become a prayer chaplain. And the first requirement was that you pray from the heart. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so there was a, which, which was a process that enhanced my growth because I realized that I wanted to be authentic when I prayed with somebody. I'd, and in order to that, it ha- I had to work on myself. So it, it all came together to start undoing the stuff, the blockages and all. So it's it's been a, it's been a miraculous. And then and I you know I encountered the evolutionary collective, and you know I got involved with them and realizing that because I always felt that oneness, it was always conscious that we all one. But I I didn't know how there was awareness of it, but I didn't know how it came together. But when I when I had actually had a chance to join the evolutionary collective. When we did the mutual, there's a practice that you do called a mutual awakening process, where you actually enter the other person and kind of feel the oneness of who they are. They express that that you, the unity happens then, and that and and to be able to kind of be, and I, my whole impression of love changed because love was really be fully in and for the other person. When somebody feels heard and listen from that space of that divinity, that's an expression of love. Yeah. And to me, that that change, that intimacy, what I, is where I wanted to be with people to kind of come from that place of really seeing them and hearing them, not just kind of talking to sort of happy half attention, really hearing them from a different place of kind of uh, availability. It would be no, no, with, uh, totally surrendered to them. And so, so that, that, that whole expression. So I mean, I'm just, that's, that's a whole journey. So I, I see how those component parts come in now. And, it, and it was, like I said, it was like charted charted for me and I it's nothing that I've really planned but it was just to do it happen so that's <laughs> and then and, and then being in, in different countries like in like Fabina saying and some uh, Michelle I was saying is that when you encounter people from different countries and you realize you know we're all the same you know people have, have family they're about their kids and everything is you know the different way of expressing but there's a fundamental thread that runs through everything. And then you, it, it makes you more compassionate, understanding, when, even if you don't understand your language, but you understand the need for, you know, for, for the, the care and the, uh, the collective grouping that needs to be to, to sustain. Everybody needs a collective to evolve, you know, you know so, so that's, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to me. I didn't <laughs> appreciate it. 
it's wonderful listening to you, John Claude, and I'm so grateful for the beautiful kinds of leadership that you're giving to the prayer ministry now. You're you've stepped into a role. You've said yes to the role of being head of the prayer ministry for a year or however long it will be for. And what an amazing gift. And this is what happens is we're invited. We're invited to say yes. Spirit never forces us, never pushes us, never tries to manipulate us, never demands. But there's an invitation, just an invitation. And it's about saying yes to the invitation. And if you don't say yes, does that mean you're going to be punished? Well, I know <laughs> it just means that the time will come when the probably someone will knock on that door again <laughs> or not, or in a different setting or in a different way. But it's all about accepting and, and uh, experiencing this inner awareness that comes from your heart. So thank you, John Claude. And thank you for the leadership you're giving to World Day of Prayer, which is a, a national event for or worldwide event for Unity of Tustin. And you're heading it up for this campus. And you, you know, you were asking me some questions about the garden, and I, I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> yeah. You said something very interesting about the garden that I never saw it like that. You said everything, all the the sites exist together. Yes. There's a shift in the background and foreground as you move from one side to the other. The others are still there, but it's just one side yeah. the foreground. And as you move from one side to side, I, I kind of, I it sort of opened a different way of looking at it. So it's always included. It's always, it's always included. Right, so I got that. Yeah, and you can't pull one piece out and throw it away because it doesn't, you don't like the color or you don't like the vibration. Yeah. And if there's anything, and you know, the repeating patterns are there, but there's also shadow crashes. If you have wounds someplace and you need healing, those, those places will come up for healing. So uh, the next site we'll be taking a deep dive with is the one on trust and the one on uh, faith. And uh, it's all of a sudden I had some trust issues come up. <laughs> You know, it's fascinating. Spirit says, oh, sweetheart, <laughs> right on time. <laughs> so, and we're never done with any of the sites. It always invites us to the next level of awareness, the next level of healing the next level of building dreams, the next level of realizing God. Mm -hmm. And then we cycle around and ultimately we move through the realms of healing. And then we learn, we move through the realms of learning and we learn ultimately how that works. And maybe we learn how to move into the realms of teaching. Well, guess what? Then the next thing is that you start bringing it together in collaboration and mm -hmm. you start <laughs> working with multiple generations <laughs> so i mean it's it, going back to that gifg club well, uh, it was showing up for me when i was a seventh grade teacher that was 50 years ago i just want to say Marge, how much of an influence you've been on me uh, to me because these areas of this metaphysical side you know you you have to actually walk it yeah, doesn't do any good to know it intellectually. You to see you do this thing, I see how things materialize. So, in the sense that vicariously, I have learned through you to watch you take those chances. You know, with the church and raising money and how it needed to, you you just put the trust in that and really to walk this. And you said it will come, whatever it is. It's those those kind of things when you observe. I didn't have to put myself in that spot, but 
vicariously through your path and kind of explaining and kind of doing that, it's allowed me to see, oh, okay, I can, I can have the courage to do that because it's given. So that, so I appreciate that. I just wanted to recognize that, that, that the gift from you. Thank you. And now what we're being called to, Jean-Claude, is another realm. And it's going to go beyond anything that existed when I was senior minister. If people say yes, there's always this big if, because it requires the saying yes. Spirit is saying, you're invited, sweetheart. Oh, darling, you finally showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and there, I mean, I use the word sweetheart or darling, there's an intimacy in it because you feel it in your heart. It's not just a head thing. Yeah. It's a heart thing. Mm -hmm. And, and it's about seeing it in the other. That's why I was so excited at one point in time about the evolutionary collective. It didn't work out for me the way that I thought it would, mm -hmm. but it worked out for other people. So it, not everyone has exactly the same path. Mm -hmm. Everyone is called in their unique way. And we're all part of a oneness that is a whole. And sometimes we live in New York and sometimes we live in Kenya. Sometimes we live in India. Sometimes we live in, in, in Southern California. <laughs> you know? It doesn't mean one's right and the other's wrong. It means we're learning how to dance together mm -hmm. and how to respect and honor and cherish the kinds of ways that we come into the dance. <laughs> and I'm looking at, at the time and we are just about out of time. <laughs> and I, I have loved talking to some people and going deeper with some people John Claude, you were fabulous. Thank you. I just see I is that Donald Walsh. Is it? Is it Donald Walsh? Yeah, Donald's here today, and we're out of time, so we don't really have time to <laughs> nice, to, nice, to continue. Nice. But there's next month. <laughs> so what I want to do, what I want to do between now and the end of the year is each month highlight another garden site but not title it by the garden site. Title it something that will intrigue people perhaps and lead them to see their destiny path at multiple levels, multiple realms. Lead them to see that we're all one, that this intimacy that, that uh, uh, we're feeling is about that. And, and the, the other thing that is so important so important is for us to begin to see how everything, art and music and all of it is part of this oneness. All of it is playing its song through us and as us. Even the things that show up and, and we feel uncomfortable with sometimes, it, it's amazing. Often the uncomfortableness is because we just don't understand it yet, or it's, it's been a wound from the past, and, and we don't know how to deal with it. And so spirit simply says, well, come over here. Let me, let me show you. <laughs> let's, let's have a dialogue. Let's, have a, let's sing a song. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, 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 I love lyrics. I love lyrics to songs. And I had one that I was going to share and now I can't find it. <laughs> um, it it's, it's so beautiful when we began to see all that is as coming up perfectly, exquisitely, inviting us into the next level of connection. One heart, one mind, one soul, always already. And uh, let's go to Liebestrom, dream of love. It's been wonderful. And thank you, thank you for being with us.
I love you. Thank you, Mars. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You, everyone. <laughs>